welcome back to the game collection. I am Super Derek, and this is The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Oblivion is the fourth entry in the Elder Scrolls series and takes place hundreds of years after the events of Morrowind. Oblivion was an extremely ambitious game for its time, featuring a sprawling game world, entirely voice acted dialogue, and a simulated network of NPCs with schedules and a limited level of autonomy. Upon its initial release, Oblivion was on the bleeding edge, but did that translate to a game that would hold up over the years? In Oblivion, you take on the role of a prisoner in the Imperial City dungeon on a fateful night. The Emperor is fleeing assassins with his protectors, and through some mix-up, your cell hides the secret entrance to their escape route. One thing leads to another, and you find yourself entrusted with the royal keepsake and tasked with tracking down the heir to the throne. Now, whether or not you choose to actually do any of this stuff is entirely up to you. Much like other entries in the series, the story of the game is pretty freeform and is composed of your decisions to join guilds, help people in need, commit crimes, or just follow the path laid out to you in the main quest line. However, simply following that main quest line to its completion after you exit the prison will most likely result in a lackluster experience, because I found it to be rather plain and repetitive, even during the trips back and forth to the Plains of Oblivion. Because of that, I highly recommend joining and completing some guild quest lines first. I particularly enjoyed the scope and scale of the Thieves Guild quest line, eventually culminating in a grand heist of legendary proportions. With Oblivion, the old adage definitely holds true that it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. However, I can't help but feel that many of the quests felt bland and formulaic. Most quest lines pointed you toward caves, derelict forts, and ancient ruins, sometimes all three, each time with the goal of killing something or acquiring an item. Many, many quests follow this formula. Some of the Dark Brotherhood quests, though, are perfect examples of how to keep things fresh. Despite each quest being centered around killing one or more targets, many quests had special objectives and bonuses for accomplishing these goals in very specific ways, and featured more scripted events and even sometimes included a bit of dark humor. It should be noted, though, that the expansion pack Knights of the Nine and especially the Shivering Isles remedied these problems as both featured very interesting and compelling quest lines. While Oblivion controls much like Morrowind, the overall gameplay is actually pretty far removed. Some concessions were made to streamline the series for better or worse. Combat has been overhauled. Now when you swing your sword or a fire spell, if it visibly connects, it always connects. No more swinging and missing because of poor dice rolls. In an attempt to make the game challenging from start to finish, Bethesda also decided to have NPCs and loot scale with player levels, and leveling has been modified in a rather strange way though. The more you use your favorite skills, the faster you get to the next level. However, the more you use your less favored skills, the higher level up multipliers you get during your next level up. The result is that if you build your character the way you think you'll play, the fewer bonus multipliers you'll get and the weaker your character will actually be in the endgame. Because of this, the difficulty isn't constant, instead it spikes the longer you play the game. And during the endgame, it's common to run into bandits and highwaymen wielding extremely expensive endgame gear which completely breaks any sense of immersion. Morrowind featured quick travel options such as riding stilt striders and boats to get to specific points of interest. However, those no longer exist in Oblivion. Instead, you're given the option to fast travel to towns immediately. This does help to break up some of the monotony, but it also makes it so that travel turns into clicking on points on a map rather than actually exploring the world. Because I was aware of this, I decided for this playthrough to play the entire game with as little fast travel as possible. One of the bigger changes that Oblivion did that made the game more accessible is that it automatically sets map markers to show where you need to go. In Morrowind, you only had a journal that could be used to glean your next destination. Sometimes you'd even have to read a few pages into a book to figure out exactly what needed to be done. But in Oblivion, all you ever have to do is follow the map marker. 
Because of this, following quest lines is laughably easy. The province in which Oblivion takes place, Cyrodiil, is actually pretty mundane when compared against its predecessor. Cyrodiil is a fairly good sized chunk of land that encompasses several slightly different biomes. There are some marshy wetlands to the south, and snowy mountains to the north, a bit of mountainous terrain to the east, and pleasant coastline to the west. The world definitely has some pretty landscapes, but it never really felt like I was in a fantasy world. This was a little bit of a letdown to me, considering the wildly alien landscapes one could find in Morrowind. Again, however, this was something that was addressed in the Shivering Isles expansion, which, unfortunately, I wasn't able to explore in this playthrough. A little bit ago I touched on the forts, ruins, and caves that quests will point you to, but what I didn't mention was the lack of variety between said forts, ruins, and caves. Each cave is indistinguishable from the last cave, and each fort has the same architecture as the next. Each ruin has the same interior decorator with the same zombies, rats, and goblins. Many locations were procedurally generated and contained randomly dispersed, level-appropriate loot. The result is that very little ever felt handcrafted, the antithesis of Morrowind. In 2006, Oblivion was a spectacle to behold. I have distinct memories of watching gameplay previews back on GameSpot and completely losing my mind over how photorealistic everything was. Playing on the PlayStation 3 for the baseline experience for this review, it was clear that there were some serious draw distance issues, where grass seemed to only exist in a 50 foot radius of my position, and sometimes entire cities would just pop into view right as I got within several feet of them. Of course, on PC, this issue is non-existent, especially with the use of mods, which are actually capable of fixing almost every aspect of Oblivion that I've criticized up to this point. And while much of that spectacle I mentioned has been lost over time, mods are available for Oblivion that are capable of some really amazing things. Also, on PC, you'll have access to game updates and bug fixes released from Bethesda, as well as from the modding community. However, on the PlayStation 3, you'll have no such luck. Not one. Not a single update or patch for the game was ever released for the PlayStation 3, which I think is uncharacteristically uncaring of Bethesda. Cruel, even, considering the state of the game. Kill him! Ah! Ah! The PlayStation 3 version, in particular, is a horrible, buggy mess, prone to crashing and animation glitches, and is poorly optimized. Things are looking quite a bit better over on the Xbox 360, the console that Oblivion was in fact designed around. The PC version also received bug fixes, but also contains that same user interface, which is highly consoleized. Again though, mods can fix that version of the game substantially. Despite all of its flaws, Oblivion sold incredibly well, and as such, is very inexpensive to purchase these days. Standard editions can be had for around 5 to 10 bucks, Game of the Year editions sell for 10 to 12, and 5th Anniversary Collector's editions sell between 15 to 25 dollars complete. If you're gonna play Oblivion, and I recommend you do, stay away from the PlayStation 3 version at all costs. Pick up a copy on PC and make sure to get a copy of the Shivering Isles while you're at it. Install plenty of mods and you're sure to have a blast. And that's why this game has a spot in the game collection. Ever want to know why I feel the way I do? Check out my playthrough by following the annotation in the lower right. If you'd like to support the show, consider becoming a patron for access to cut and behind the scenes content, status updates, and video commentaries just like these awesome people.